It is truly a privilege to welcome Professor Susanna Lipscomb this afternoon. Susanna really needs no introduction. She is acclaimed historian, award-winning academic and author of five books and co-editor of another. She has written and presented 18 television history documentary series on the BBC, ITV, Channel 5 and so many others. She is a columnist for the History Today. If this were not enough, Susanna was creative director of the award-winning We Are Best exhibition at the National Trust's Hardwick Hall in 2018-19. Susanna's research focuses on 16th century, both English and French history. This afternoon, she will be sharing her fascinating insight into life of women to the times, revealing archival detail and exploring how women navigated power in the 16th century. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you. Thank you so much um, for tuning in today uh, to, to hear about tales of women in the 16th century. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen with you now so you get to uh, see some, my, some of my PowerPoint as I go along. But we'll come in and out of that as we go. The truth of the matter is that most women who ever lived left no trace of their existence on the record of history. In Europe in the 16th century, about 5% of women at most were literate and they were members of the elite. And that means that ordinary women left no letters, no diaries, no helpful notebooks expressing their thoughts and feelings. They tended to have few possessions, so they didn't tend to make that many wills. Um, they had no status under the law when they were married, so they don't really appear that often before criminal courts. And in France, which is where we're going to be concentrating on today, in courts where they do sometimes appear, ecclesiastical courts, um, before the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, no records survive between about 1540 and 1667. So we have this massive gap. What we do know about women at this time indicates their lack of power. So they were believed to be weaker than men, physically, uh, morally, emotionally, um, in every way, and certainly intellectually. Under humoral theory at the time, which you probably know is the balance of four humours, women were considered to be uh, colder and wetter and men to be hotter and drier. And this had some consequences. So it was thought that women's cold, moist constitutions was what rendered them emotional and illogical. Um, women menstruated, men with all that excess heat burnt up the excess blood. Um, women did not grow bald. Men had all that heat that burnt off their hair. Uh, women's matter collected around their hips, but men had that heat that drove their matter heavenward, giving them big, strong so shoulders. In fact, it was actually thought that women were deformed men, that there hadn't been enough heat in the process of conception to force their genitals out of their body. And this was thought from the time of Aristotle onwards. And because women were imperfect and imperfect things long after the perfect, women were considered to be more lustful than men. In fact, sex was thought to be biologically necessary for women. And there could be terrible consequences if you didn't have enough sexual intercourse, uh, for including the wandering womb. You've come across the word hysteria. You probably know it relates to the word uterus in Greek. Your womb could wander around your body, women, and it could produce depression and irrationality. And William Harvey, who discovered the circulation of the blood, and otherwise we would say, you know, it's the cutting edge of the scientific revolution, wrote this about the uterus, that it was insatiable, ferocious and animal-like. And it wasn't just sexual lechery that was the problem. Women were thought to be more easily tempted to sin than men in every way, because, of course, Eve had been the conduit of sin into the world. And so the consequence of all this was that women were thought to need men to hold them upright. And the colliery was that they were not entitled to power. Um, they could not hold public office, they could not go into higher education, they couldn't take up roles in the church or in law or in government, they were on the fringes of the medical profession. They couldn't join trade guilds except when they were widowed. And in France, under Salic law, they couldn't even inherit the throne as they could in England with Mary and Elizabeth. 
Men's word carried more weight than women's. Uh, the word testimony is related to the word testis. Um, and women were legally subject to their husband in all things. Uh, for example, when they married, a woman's goods and possessions became the property and responsibility of her husband, and he could dispose of them without her knowledge or consent. So a married woman couldn't own property and divorce was illegal. But this was a period in which it was terribly common um, for women to experience a certain amount of um, physical discipline by their husbands, as it was thought at the time. We'd call it domestic abuse. Uh, at the time, it was considered acceptable if it was done moderately, soberly, and for good cause. So imagine once women are married, which tend to be, by the way, uh, relatively late for ordinary women, um, there was a culture of life cycle service. So at about the age of 13, ordinary women would become domestic servants and enter into another household and then work in order to save up money for their dowry. And that could be 10, 15 years. Men at the same sort of time were becoming apprentices and then journeying up uh, to be journeymen and then to become masters so that they could raise up money to build their own establishment. So we have to imagine marriage is happening for most people um, much later than we've imagined, more like us in the late, their late 20s, 25 to 28 or something like that. So once a woman had become uh, married, then if she could, she would probably start having children pretty quickly because at the time there was no reliable contraception. This means that women, once they were married, were pregnant on average every other year. And that means that they had eight, 10, 12 pregnancies. Um, and every time they got pregnant, two lives were at stake. Maternal death rates were 16 to 25 per thousand live births. Today, for comparison, they're eight out of every 100,000 live births and half of all children died in the first year of life. So you can suddenly imagine that women's lives after marriage were physically concerned with uh, pregnancy, childcare, and emotionally, um, among other things, concerned with grief. There was very little time <laughs> For them to get anything done or to operate with any power. It seems that women's lot was pretty much uh, downtrodden, caught up with babes in arms, silent, in many ways oppressed. But today I want to talk to you about research that I did for my latest book, 1,200 cases that are drawn from the Protestant authorities of southern France between 1560 and 1615. These cases shed new light on the realities of ordinary women's lives and power. But let me first of all back up a bit and tell you about these records and how they came to be. Because they relate to people converting to Protestantism, which in France they did in large numbers from the 1530s onwards, but especially in the 1550s. And if you see here, I'll go back to my screen, we have uh, an idea of what that looked like because people converted in a kind of swathe across um, France uh, that was uh, particularly focused on the Languedoc area, the ancient province of Languedoc, uh, which is bordered by the Rhone um, to the east, the Mediterranean to the south, the Garonne to the west, and the massive Centrale above the Tarn River to the north. And in this area, certain towns and cities became strongholds of Protestantism, which is to say that the town councils, the consuls, um, the courts were all in Protestant hands. One of these was the city of Nîmes, which by 1562 had a population that was 50% Protestant. And the extraordinary thing is that it remained so, despite the fact that that year also marked the beginning of a cycle of deadly religious wars that would last for four decades, despite even the St Bartholomew's Day massacre of 1572 in which 10,000 Protestants were killed in Paris and other cities within about four days. And crucially, what was going on at this time of being this minority city surrounded quite often literally by a sea of Catholic hostile forces, 
the only way that these Protestants felt that they could assuage God's wrath, the only way to survive was, they thought, to follow a strict moral code. And so in each town and city that they dominated, the church set up con consistories. A consistory was a panel of men. It was both the governing body and welfare center of the church, but it was also above all its moral tribunal. It met 56 times a year, so more than once a week. And every time they met, they would consider um, who had done things wrong. Uh, they would interrogate people, they would keep depositions um, and they would call people before them. Now, the consistory was made up of between 10 and 20 men the church ministers were on it, and then there were lay elders and deacons who had been appointed to it and a scribe who wrote everything down, as you can see here. And the elders had a district of a few streets that they policed. This is a map of Nîmes in 1562, and uh, drawn by Adrian Thiel. And this is um, a, a picture showing modern Nîmes, and I've mapped the old city onto it. You can see the Roman amphitheater, Les Arènes, at the bottom. And it's divided into these districts. Each of these districts had a couple of elders or an elder or two who were appointed to oversee it. Um, and this is just a few streets, as you can see, looking at the size of them. And they, were, they had to oversee the area and then report back any failings. And they took their charge really seriously. Routine gossip was investigated. Every indiscretion was seen and reported every impropriety resulted in a summons to appear. And when they've discovered people doing things wrong and called them before the consistory, then they could punish them if they discovered they were guilty in various ways. For a start, they punished them through a, a range of shaming punishments. Um, so they, the first thing was that they would ask them to repent before the consistory's meeting itself. But if it was slightly worse as a sin, then they would ask them to repent before the whole church on a Sunday. If it were worse still, or if they were, you know, somebody who did the things again and again, then they would suspend them from the Eucharist, which was the central rite of the church. And the worst case scenario was excommunication from the church, which meant no social or economic intercourse with the members of the church. And for quite a while, historians used to think that these punishments, because they weren't corporal or capital punishment, although actually, in fact, the consistory often was working hand in glove with the local authorities who could do those things. But historians used to think that they were slightly toothless as punishments. But that's to underestimate what shame does to a person uh, and how it really gnaws away at someone's uh, self-esteem. So, for example, when Jean Mingold, who was a butcher, was found to have uh, committed adultery with a woman called Suzanne Bertrand in 1589 in Nîmes, and he was told by the consistory that he would need to confess it before the whole gathered church that Sunday, he said to the consistory that they were being too severe with him and that he would prefer to suffer death immediately than perform the said reparation. Now, we don't necessarily need to take his words at face value, but it gives us some indication of how awful it felt to be accused um, and be told that you needed to confess before everybody. The object of all of this moral discipline was to create a community visibly distinguished by holiness. And so there were certain disciplinary priorities that the consistory had um, when they considered what they wanted done. They cared, for example, about eradicating superstition and heterodoxy. They were con particularly concerned with women going to visit the Bohemian, wandering Romany people who could um, offer medicine and healing, and above all, could tell your fortune, divination. They were concerned with the playing of games, bull, skittles, cards, gambling. They were concerned with celebrations and festivals because they tended to dancing. And dancing, they thought, was dissolute and scandalous, tending to fornication. They also were concerned about quarrels and fights, theft, violence, insults. They would seek reconciliation between people. But above all, what they were concerned with was sexual sin. 
They were concerned with fornication, adultery, sexual assault, and prostitution. They were concerned with making a society that looked holy. And they kept all the records of their, um, of their interrogations in these beautiful uh, documents that are kept now in the archives in Paris and those in the departments of France. And here you can see it. It says the register of the Reformed Church of Nîmes. It's between 1595 and 1601. And it's bound in vellum and the pages are parchment. And inside we see pages like this, covered with secretary hand, um, filled with cases of interrogation, uh, depositions, deliberations and conclusions. And focusing on 1560 to 1615, I have examined the records of 16 cities and towns. In the end, I've focused on 10 of them. Some 9,000 pages of these registers and using, in the end, 1,200 cases and supporting that with other archival material like baptismal and marriage registers, um, a criminal register of cases of sentences that we'll see a bit later on, um, and various other things, notarial records. Now, the consistory's preoccupations, um, the fact that they were concerned with controlling morals and the thought that at the time it was thought that women were more easily inclined towards sin than men, meant that they were concerned with controlling women. And this means that the sources have much to tell us about women's lives. And they give us insight into moments when things went wrong. So moments of social breakdown like um, marital quarrels, rape, malicious gossip, illegitimate pregnancies. These are fissures which act for us as windows into their society. So we get an idea about women's faith, their social relationships, their marriages, um, their sex lives, and those two things aren't always coterminous. Um, moments of crisis, um, their beliefs about magic, courtship, all this sort of stuff. And the fact is that the consistory records are peculiarly useful to telling us about ordinary women's lives and peculiarly um, valuable because, as I've already alluded to, um, between about 1540 and 1660, there are actually very few other records that tell us about the reality of ordinary women's mentalities and behaviour and the ways they, they, in which they acted with agency. But there are also a few other reasons why these sources are particularly valuable. Women could initiate cases before the consistory. Um, when in before legal courts, they became incapable once they were married. But women could initiate cases before the consistory and their testimonies were all written down and, and taken to some extent seriously. There was no fee to use the consistory. That meant that it was open to the poor. And the fact that there weren't those off-putting corporal and capital punishments meant that it was less taxing for the conscience of the informant when they came along to tell a tale. And then finally, the fact that it was a voluntary institution, that people joined it, the church that is, in order to demonstrate their respectability as, as well as, as for, for good reasons of belief, but they could denounce other people in order to look holy so it would reflect back well on them, made them look respectable if they told tales. And for all these reasons, the sources, the consistory records are absolutely jam full of cases that tell us about women and give us women's stories and give us access to women's voices. Now, they're mediated, they're curtailed, but they're just about audible. And so today I'm going to give you five cases that tell us about women and power. And we're gonna be thinking about the ways in which women in the past, although technically powerless, acted as if they had power. It's like they didn't know it. <laughs> the records show us how ordinary people, ordinary women could use the tiny pieces of power that they had. And particularly the focus today is going to be looking at the power of the tongue because women could use their words as a very significant sanction. And so we're going to be thinking about some ways in which they could do that. So let us back to the, go back to the records and let us start by thinking about how women could use their words 
um, in order to oversee, regulate and judge the behaviour of others. Our first case takes us to Nîmes in 1597. And this is the case of a woman called Jeanne Parette. Parette uh, presented herself at the consistory uh, in Nîmes in June 1597 and brought a case against the widow of Monsieur Nanjou and her married daughter. We're not given a name for her. Well, we're not really given names for either of them. And, and a woman called Jean Nancel, um, at the wife of Pierre Coste and Beatrix de Cruvin, who we're told is the widow of Monsieur Crasse. So we've got two widows, two married women. And this group of women had been spreading a rumor that Jeanne Parette was a public whore, a prostitute. And they are saying that a young foundry worker came to visit her in secret. So Parette had presented herself at the consistory to complain about this. Now the rumor we're told had started one day when a man called Ponce Père had visited uh, Jeanne and had knocked at her door and found that the door was locked. And he had peered through the window and seen a man inside with her who was not her husband. So he had cried out to the group of women on the street about what was going on. This was Nanju and her daughter and Nancel. He cried out to them that Parette had locked the door, that there was a man inside. And so the group of women approached the house and shouted to her that she did not act well to stay with a man all alone and to have closed the door behind them and that they could not think anything good of her and that they did not want to put up with such assignations, and that if she continued, they would have to denounce her to the magistrate. At this moment in time, Beatrix de Cluvan was passing, saw the group assembled, heard the hubbub, and asked what was going on, and said it ought not to be endured. Now, the funny thing is, there were probably perfectly legitimate grounds for Jeanne Parrette to be inside with this man. Um, he was described as... Uh, a foundry worker, and they're described as being of uh, being of her occupation. She was married to an armourer or a cutlerer. In other words, he was probably employed in the marital household workshop. But the group of women were really quick to judge the confinement as necessarily sexual, and they asserted their right to judge such behaviour. The way they acted posited their right to get involved and to delineate the boundaries of acceptable conduct. And they assumed the moral responsibility to report such scandalous behavior to the authorities and to gossip about it meanwhile. In other words, they're arrogating to themselves the role as moral guardians and as moral judges. Women could also mobilize into action. In May, 1588, we have another group of neighborhood women led by the wife of Guillaume des Arènes and her neighbor, Marguerite. These women gathered outside the house of a man called Videl Raymond. Um, Videl Raymond was a maker of pack saddles. He lived in the Arènes, the Roman amphitheater that in the 16th century had been converted into dwellings. And these women, as the surname suggests, were his neighbors. And what happened was this. They beat their fists on his door. They cried out to Raymond to let them Raymond to let them in, saying that they knew that he had a woman inside with them. He said, no, nope, that's absolutely not the case. He denied it completely. But they forced an entry and they found a woman in there trying to hide herself under the straw. They chased her out. They called her a whore and they reported it uh, to an elder. They were still talking about it months later. In other words, we see here, once again, women arrogating this right to oversee and regulate the behavior of others and to pass judgment. Women could also, however, use the power of their words, their publicly voiced scorn and their action to shame errant husbands. Our next story tells us of a woman who, if it weren't for her outbursts, would never have appeared in any records at all, would be completely lost to history. And for this, we need to go over to Montebon, the city of Montebon in the West. And we're telling the story of a woman called Anne de Valety in June 1595. Anne de Valety discovered her husband, Pierre Cordonnier, 
trying to have sex with their maid and she reacted with violence in word and deed. The testimony that we have, first of all, comes from a man called Pierre Arnold. He was known as Balafra, dancer. Completely incidental detail, but quite fun. He was an armourer, again, in Francois Mingot's workshop. And Arnold said that on the 28th of June, coincidentally, 1595, he saw Anne de Valety coming out of her house crying and speaking to her female neighbours. She said that her husband had been trying to have sex with their maid, that she had found them lying on a sack together, but had managed to stop them before they were successful. Arnold had heard her say, in Occitan, which was the language, the dialect of the area, Norio jamais pensat que mon mari a guesfash a queste acte. I would never have thought my husband would have done this act. And this apparently isn't the only time the husband tried. <laughs> the consistory questioned Courtney himself a bit later about an incident that had happened allegedly on the 16th of July. Anne de Valety and her sister had found Courtney and the maid this time in the room where the meal was bolted. This was obviously a room underneath the main building, the room uh, in which people lived. And at this time, we know, we're told that Anne de Valety took up a sieve, hit the maid several times with it, and then threw her out of the house. When asked about this, Courtney denied it completely. He said his wife did nothing but murmur and prattle. He said that he'd been going downstairs to church. It was a Sunday after all. And his wife had hidden herself in the bolting room and seen him and then seen the maid descend the stairs. And this had augmented her jealousy. So the consistory decided to ask some neighbours, some witnesses. They asked Francois Mingaud's wife, Marthe de Prizac, who we're told was 30 years old. Very occasionally the consistory would think that they were a law court and they would write down details like somebody's age. And then most of the time they forgot. But we happen to know that Marthe de Prizac was 30. And she said that some time before she had seen Anne de Valety sitting in the street and Anne de Valety had told her she should keep watch on her maid that her husband does not do with her what Courtney did with his. She said that Anne had told her about finding her husband and her maid lying together on the sack, behaving badly together, had grabbed the sieve, had sacked the maid. In other words, in Marc de Prysac's memory, she's conflated the two events. Then there's an element of doubt introduced. Another witness, female witness, is called Astrid Danzu. She says that Prysac has made it all up out of malice conceived against uh, Courtney's wife. And then finally in October, Anne de Valety herself appeared, denied it all, said that Prysac had invented it out of spite to put her and her husband into discord and admitted only to dismissing the maid because she was not well reputed. And this is the version the consistory chose to believe. But it's wholly unconvincing. What we know is that the discovery of her husband's infidelity or attempted infidelity affected her very much emotionally. It was very distressing to her. Arnaud said that she was toute éplorée. She was completely grief stricken. Even if we believe what Courtney said, he said that she was driven by jealousy. So we see from her a reaction of anger and tears at her shame and dishonor. But she didn't only weep. She also used her speech and her authority in the public arena to influence the course of events. She used her female network to denounce and humiliate her husband, holding him up for public inspection and finding him wanting. For the shame he had brought on her, she shamed him with her words. And she also acted. She hit the maid with the nearest object to hand, or her husband, or both of them, and then she used her power as a housewife to dismiss the maid. And if any of Courtney's testimony is to be believed, perhaps the second time round, she lay in wait for them, suggesting a level of premeditation uh, to expose her husband's guilt. And it's likely, I think, that her ultimate silence in October was also uh, a strategy, that it was a fascinating indication of the way that women could attempt to direct events, that it was a um, private 
deal between husband and wife, bearing the hatchet, dispensing with the court of public opinion after its work had been done, a face-saving exercise, if you will. Because she also, at that moment in time, used her female network to support her. Danzo, her friend Astrid Danzo, came in and said this was all an intra-female quarrel, and that was what the consistory chose to believe. Women could also use the power of their words to secure some measure of justice after abuse. And our next case here, also in Montauban, is the case of Jeanne Gourcide. She was also known as La Gascon because she was from Gascony in Bordeaux, and uh, she was a servant girl. So that means immediately we know that she was somewhere between the age of 13 and at most 28. Uh, but I mean, I would suggest we, we imagine her probably in her late teens or early 20s. She came to the attention of the consistory in July 1595 in a rather roundabout way. Um, she was a Catholic. And so, in fact, she herself never testified before the consistory. But we have the testimonies of six witnesses and each of them provides a piece of the puzzle. Jeanne had gone to Montauban in search of work, which is standard behaviour, and she had been employed as a maidservant in the household of a Protestant man called Jean de Cortin. We first see her name in the records when a married couple from the nearby town of Orgoy had brought a child to Montauban, asking for it to be baptised into the Huguenot, the Protestant faith, and stating that Jeanne was its mother. At the same time, public rumour was making it clear that uh, the father, or the alleged father of this child, was uh, a man called Pierre Delhost. Now, Pierre Delhost was a sailor. You see his name in the records here. And he was the father-in-law of Jeanne's former employer, Jean Courtine. Now, from another source, I was able to learn a bit more about Pierre Delhost. This is... A, um, a register of criminal sentences passed in Montauban between 1534 and 1606. And in this register of criminal sentences, we find Pierre Delhost's name twice. Here he is in a case, um, also in 1595, with a woman called Marguerite Rennes. And here he is, he, she is, he is named in this case of Payardise. Now, Payadis comes from the word pai for hay. It almost literally means rolling in the hay. It's sexual sin, it's fornication, sex outside marriage. Um, and we see him named here with Marguerite Wren, and we also see him named with another woman in December 1595 in a nearby town called Gayak. And from these records, we also learn his age, that he's 60 years old. In other words, what we have here is, I mean, the politest word I could use is a womanizer, but I think actually we might go so far as to say a sexual predator. So what happened in Jeanne, uh, Jeanne um, Lagascon's case is that she was, her, her employer, Jean Cotin, was first of all summoned to the consistory to give his testimony. He was first of all admonished for the scandal of having let his maid leave his house pregnant some months earlier, three months earlier, in fact, and he advised um, that he, you know, he had uh, tried to stop her, he had tried to prevent the thing, but he was accused immediately by the consistory of having allowed her to take some medicine um, in order to try and abort the child. In fact, that he had um, recommended to her that she abort, and the words the consistory use are the fruit which she had in her stomach, and that he's told by the consistory that he will be culpable before God for this. He confessed that he had called the surgeon Pierre Gobi at Jeanne's behest um, and after an angry exchange with his father-in-law. And the consistory was very perturbed about this attempted abortion. And so then on the 2nd of August, 1595, they summoned the surgeon, um, Pierre Gobi. He said that he had seen La Gascon. Um, she had asked for medicine to bring on her flowers, i.e. menstruation, but he had replied that the time was not right, and we'll see the time it really wasn't right. But we know that Jeanne accessed something because the next witness is female. It's Jeanne's friend, Astrid Capelan. Capelan testified that Jeanne had gone to stay with her 
after the pregnancy became public. So we can imagine this is after there's a visible bump. And here we get real access to Jeanne's thoughts. As Astrug and Jeanne lay side by side in bed together, pretty much no one slept alone in the 16th century, Jeanne said to her friend that she had an overburdened liver and that she was taking some medicine to purge herself. At this point, Astrug <laughs> pushed her hand, you know, lay her hands on uh, Jeanne on her full breast, on her burgeoning belly, and said in the dialect of the time, Jeanne Arez, non tu podes pas de dire que non si on prenne. Jeanne, stop. And what I like about this, Arez is a word that you use to stop cattle. It's very rustic. Jeanne, stop. You cannot say that you're not pregnant. At this moment, at this instant, we're told, Jeanne said, yes, she was. She was seven months pregnant, that the father was Pierre Delhost, that she was in such great despair that she had resolved to kill herself, um, that she carried a knife with her with which to do so. Astrid told her that if she did that, she wouldn't only kill herself, but she would kill the child that she was carrying. She was very wretched to want to do such a thing. And in various words, managed to persuade Jan away from trying to die by suicide. This is a fascinating glimpse into a female response to a frankly very common situation in 16th century France. An unmarried pregnant, an unmarried servant made pregnant by her employer or her employer's relative. Hashtag them too. Jeanne was a typical disempowered woman. Um, she was likely to be very young. She was a foreigner to the region, so she was away from her kin and her friends. Um, she spoke a different dialect and she was a servant girl, so she was among the least powerful of her sex in a patriarchal age. There's no direct evidence of rape, but circumstantially it seems credible to me. Consider the power relations of the large age gap, the large status gap. The relationship of Del Host with her employer meant that Gorsied um, Jeanne was hardly in a position to resist his advances. In short, all the evidence suggests, um, or implies at least, a case of sexual assault or rape by, uh, of a young teenage girl by a much older man in her workplace. And in case you're wondering, paternity is not in doubt. In September, Pierre Delhost himself appeared before the consistory and um, said yes, he'd had sex with Gorsied, um, and he knew that she knew that she had got pregnant and had since given birth. He refused to make public reparation for his sins, and as a result, was suspended from the Eucharist. Now, through Jeanne's confession to Astrug, we see something of her feelings about the situation. The way she divulged the truth so quickly, her friend, the words sort of spilling out of her once her friend had acknowledged, you know, the truth of the matter suggests deep relief at her friend's discernment. She seems to have been heavily burdened by shame. The notion of wanting to expel, the, to purge herself, to expel the intruder fetus from her body, this desire to wash away sin, to be shriven, to be purified, these are feelings that are often concomitant with rape. She tried to deal with the pregnancy, first of all, by ignoring it, it's only at, at, it seems, about seven months that she's trying to get some sort of abortificent. And then when that doesn't work, she's try, she considers ki killing herself in order to get out of this situation. It seemed to her it was the only way to cope. And for many young women, the shame, the loss of employment, the financial necessity created by such sexual abuse was devastating. And Del Host's insouciant admission of his guilt stands in stark contrast with the distress that we hear from Jeanne herself. But the astonishing thing is that her speech to Capelan was not the end of the story. Their conversation marked a shift because Gorsi, Jeanne Gorsi, ultimately chose not to take the medicine, not to kill herself. And when the child was born, she manufactured a situation in which it would be baptized into the faith of its father in Montebon itself. And that's how we first hear of her, that couple coming to bring the baby to be baptized in Montebon. 
Now, of course, this is part maternal care. She's arranging status for the child in the community of its father. But I wonder if there isn't something else going on there as well, because perhaps there's a more calculated purpose. It's through this mechanism that Père Delhost is called to account and the Catholic Jeanne never testifies. She never appears before the consistory. And the rumor of the paternity that in fact brings Delhost before the consistory almost certainly came from Jeanne herself. So despite her relative powerlessness and her previous abuse, we can conclude that Jeanne had successfully manipulated the systems of her society to regain some measure of control and revenge. Now, we mustn't overstate this. She was still unmarried. She was still unemployed. She still had a child to care for and to support. But at the very least, she had used the consistory, even as a Catholic, to make known and have recorded her version of events, her truth. And she wasn't the only woman to do so. Our final case takes us back to Nîmes. And here we're looking at the power of women's words to force reluctant men to marry them. This is the case of Isabel Viel um, in 1578, also in June. This is a young Catholic girl who claimed to the consistory that uh, she had made engagement vows with a, a, a young Protestant carder called uh, Claude Dupont. So Claude and Isabel were called before the consistory and Claude said that they had not made vows. In fact, he said rather viciously, he would never marry her and he would rather leave the country than do so. He said his mother uh, was opposed to the match. She disapproved of Isabel and he described Isabel as a papist, a thief, and according to rumors, a whore. These are words that could destroy a reputation. And then he added that he had heard that she had got pregnant in Arles, a nearby town, uh, when she'd been living with her aunt. Then they turned to Isabel. Isabel said that they had talked of marriage and she had offered to show him a vineyard that she owned that would be part of her dowry. So they went to see it, they talked, they decided to get married, and so then they had gone to see her uncle, Jacques Dubois. And at Jacques Dubois' house, they had performed the ritual that meant you were engaged at this period of time. It was called um, the donation de corps, the giving of the bodies. They promised to give their bodies to each other. They had then drunk in the name of marriage and asked if she had promised to marry him. She replied, yes, and if it pleased the consistory, the said marriage should be affected. At this point, the consistory turned back to Claude. Now he amended his story. He said, okay, he didn't promise to marry her and they didn't perform the ritual of the Donation de Cour, but they did drink in the name of marriage. He also said that at the time that he would have to see if his mother consented. And he took this opportunity to reiterate the rumors that Isabel had been pregnant and his charming character assassination that she was a papist, a thief and a whore, and this time he added, and a drunk. And he also repeated his unflattering remark about never taking her in marriage, but rather leaving the country first. Witnesses were called. Isabel's aunt, Jeanne Dondel, said yes, she had been present and they had promised to marry each other. Isabel's uncle, Jacques Dubois, confirmed they had promised to marry each other, they had drunk in the name of marriage and they had performed the Donation des Cours. Two weeks later, Claude's mother, Anton Antonio Boisset, appeared in voluble spirits, um, having traveled to make the, her, her opinion heard before the consistory. She was opposed to the marriage, she said, and that if Claude married the girl, she would you know, re reject him as her son. He was far too young to wed. Uh, she didn't want him to marry a papist and she would never consent to the marriage. Now, this was a real dilemma for the consistory because at this point, um, they thought, on the one hand, you've got a mixed marriage between Protestant and Catholic, not a good thing, and a lack of parental consent, which was meant that the marriage could not be possible under French law if Claude was too young. They didn't know his age. On the other hand, if the marriage had been contracted and there were witnesses saying it had, then according to Protestant regulations, it had to go ahead. Um, uh, betrothal vows were as binding as marriage vows. 
so perplexed they called two more witnesses, Francois Comte, a neighbor who said, yes, he had been present when Isabel and Claude swore that they would marry each other and they would be loyal to each other. And he added tellingly, Claude had said nothing about wanting to see what his mother thought. And Guillaume Gorgas, another weaver who said that he too had been present at Jacques Dubois' house when Claude and Isabel had given their bodies reciprocally to one another and drunk in the name of marriage. So the consistory is faced with this dilemma, four witnesses swearing it's taken place, Claude's mother refusing him consent to marry and suggesting that he was too young to proceed without her consent. And I think at this point, the pair's attitudes became of crucial importance because the consistory had initially assumed after Claude's colorful uh, description of Isabel that the marriage was a falsehood. They referred to it as a pretended marriage, that it was only alleged by Isabel. But as the case wore on and evidence emerged of Isabel being continually acquiescent to the consistory's authority, despite being a Roman Catholic, the case slowly swung in her favour. And her opening statement to them, when asked if she wanted to marry the, the, the Claude, if it pleased the consistory, the marriage should be achieved, uh, set the tone. And such conciliatory comments were, by contrast, with Claude's misleading and ever-changing dispositions, his evident hostility towards his proposed bride and his humiliatingly public slanders. And when the consistory asked Isabel whether she was of the reformed faith and she replied, no, but she had the courage to become so, she won their hearts. And it's worth considering why, because if Claude's abuse of Isabel, although obviously drawn from sort of stock abuse used against women, if it was based on any truth at all, if Isabel wasn't, was known to have had a poor reputation, if she had had a pregnancy, their marriage would have been both hard to secure and incredibly valuable to her. And the fact is that despite her Catholicism, she's so peculiarly submissive to the consistory's authority and her compliance so effectively highlights Claude's mendacity, suggests to me that Isabel was powerfully and subtly influencing the consistory to her own ends. She may not appear that vocal, but what she did say was very canny. She was determined to get what she wanted. And she wasn't the only one. In court, Claude's mother, Antonio, was thoroughly manipulative, threatening to disown him if the marriage went ahead, giving him that choice between obedience to his mother and to the vows he had made. What judgment would the consistory reach? Well, they were uncertain enough to take the case to uh, the Synod at Montpellier, the next stage up of Protestant authorities, where Claude's uncle Francois appeared and confirmed that Claude was old enough to marry and gave his consent, which eclipsed um, the mother's resistance. And so at this point, consent was no longer an issue and the case came down to which account seemed true. And of course, it was the account with all the witness statements behind it uh, Isabel's version of events was upheld. The church eventually judged that the marriage was good and valid. In other words, they upheld the words of a submissive Catholic girl against a belligerent Protestant man. One has to wonder why she still wanted to marry him after everything he'd said. And ironically, it may be because some of his insults had a basis in truth. These are only just four, and I'm showing you just uh, oh, just four pictures and five cases out of 1,200. But they start to show us how women could be powerful in an age in which they were officially powerless. We see women dictating and policing the moral behavior of others, especially of other women. We see them using the power of their female networks to humiliate errant husband, we see them using the power of gossip to bring a probable rapist to account. We see them using their acquiescence to win the hands of recalcitrant men. And in all their cases, they were using the world, the word words to turn the world upside down. They became elders themselves. We'd have wife turning against husband, maidservant against employer. We have female prey turned predator. The consistory may have had as part of its remit to controlling women. But the ironic unintended consequence of that and the fact that they were open to the poor, that they lacked those off-putting corporal and capital punishments, that they listened to and recorded women's voices is that the consistory itself became a mechanism that women could try to use for their own ends. And at the same time, I suspect that there was nothing particularly exceptional about these women. I suspect that actually 
what we have here is a certain situation in which the existence of these records and the circumstances of their creation just allows us an opportunity to eavesdrop on their words, to peer, as it were, into their worlds in a way that few other records have done. And as a result, we get to glimpse the reality of ordinary 16th century women's lives in a way that has until now been lost to history. Thank you very much for staying with me throughout all of this. Now, I'm gonna take some questions that have come through. Um, and the first question I've got sent through is from Heather, Heather Phelps. Are there many or any records of homosexual relationships among women in terms of personal correspondence or prostitution? If so, how are these relationships viewed by society? It's a really good question. As I say, we don't have much personal correspondence from these women. Um, so um, we have some, not this isn't what you're asking, but there are occasional references to homosexual relationships between men in front of the consistory, um, but it, it referred to as sodomy. That is considered so serious that it disappears very quickly from the consistory's records and moves up to the criminal courts. Women's homosexual relationships are much harder to police, as you might imagine. Um, and so there's no, in all of the records I looked at between 1560 and 1615, there is no uh, accusation of women being found having sex with each other. Um, but they would probably not have been discovered because as I've explained to you, women uh, tended to sleep in beds with other women. There, were, there was multiple opportunity for that until before marriage at least. Um, and even after marriage, they might well sleep in a bed with their servants. So uh, the circumstances of being discovered were probably not that uh, obvious. That we do know, um, in terms of, you also mentioned prostitution, there are lots of cases about prostitution, which I don't talk about, in, in the book because it, uh, the voices of mean because it just become too long but I have some wonderful stories uh, if wonderful is the word for women who um, were involved uh, who became sex workers in various different ways um, including one woman called Catherine Formantine who I have appearing in the sources for about 25 years and so I can see the record from how she moves from having her uh, the marriage that she wants to make cannot happen um, and then later she, we see her appearing as a prostitute and later still appearing as a procuress or a madam. Next question. Okay, Turner Starr asks, how did marriages help families to rise up the greasy pole of Tudor politics uh, in the court of Catherine of Aragon? That's a massive question. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I mean, Marriages are sort of how, uh, marriages weren't very much political. We're talking, that's a sort of very different end of society. Um, so if we're thinking about um, gentry and uh, nobility, then marriages are very much made uh, in order to advance um, the family's pol political interests, um, to advance their economic interests. Um, so they are to, uh, you know, establish control of a certain set of lands, for example. Um, so that that's one way. I mean, that's certainly one way to rise, particularly as a woman. You know, we met, uh, Michelle mentioned Bess of Hardwick and our exhibition there. Uh, Bess is a woman who married four times in the later 16th century uh, and each time enriched herself um, and, and rose as it were as a result. For men on the whole, I mean, marriages could advance them and I can think of some cases, but also they would advance through service in the church or um, uh, one thinks of Wolsey or in the law, one thinks of Cromwell. So it is possible to rise through a range of different ways, but marriages, marriages could, um, give one more political power because you gave them because you had more wealth or a title okay so we've got the sentinel 909 <laughs> says you mentioned that women would get married and start bearing children much later than originally thought where does this myth of the 15 year old bride originate what it what's going on there is that we, we're extrapolating from what happens for royalty and aristocracy to imagine it happens across uh, society as a whole so it is true that we do have marriages arranged between, um, well, think of, talking of Catherine of Aragon, think of Catherine of Aragon and Arthur Tudor. Uh, 
So she's 16, they delayed it, her parents have delayed a bit before letting her come to England. She's 16, um, when they marry, he is 15. That is common, uh, and it was only after 15 that generally speaking, um, marriages were allowed to be consummated, which is it would also an important point. But that's not what's going on for ordinary people. And so that's the thing is that quite often we have so many errors in our understanding of what people like us would have been like in the past because we uh, map onto them what would have happened in royal and aristocratic families. Chloe Lees asks, widows seem to have had better status. Could they own or run businesses? That's right. So when so much of the way that um, work occurred was uh, in a, a union really a sort of uh, very much like many of us have been doing under lockdown this sort of household workshop where you are doing your doing your trade at home and also you know running your domestic life um, and husband and wife would often be engaged would be engaged in the same trade occasionally we have instances where wives have separate trades but that's um it's, it's not that common on the whole they and often they are marrying into the trade that they're you know, a man from the trade of their father. So they've learnt it as a child and they move into, then they perhaps become a maidservant in that house, in a household where that trade's being practiced. And anyway, and then they marry a man who has been training in that trade. So they are become an essential part of that work. That means that they know how to do it, whether it, you know, it's being a glover or um, whether it's uh, uh, making clocks or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, these women could then if they didn't remarry, head up the business that they and their husband had created, um, they could join a, a trade guild under their own name. If they remarried, they lost all of that. I have a question here. Um, it's only initial, so uh, uh, it's incredible that ordinary French women were heard and used their wily ways. Was there no similar judiciary in England during this time for common folk? There are similar judiciaries, there are church courts um, it, the women can use uh, and do use, but the regulations on them are slightly different. Um, and so, uh, and what they're getting at is slightly different. Um, so they're just, the, I recommend the work of Martin Ingram, among others, to look into what, uh, how those, how church courts were used by women in England. It's fascinating stuff. Stuart Gibbs asks, from this insight, would it be fair to say that the social interactions of this period are far more complex than previously presented? You hit the nail on the head, Stuart, that's exactly it. Um, that what, there's so, it's so easy to assume because obviously women, you know, aren't uh, priests or they aren't lawyers, that they don't have power. They have power. They, um, they take hold of whatever power is, is possibly available to them. Um, and the, fa the fact is that there's so many other cases in which we have ma maid servants bringing cases against employers and that sort of thing. They're not daunted by the structures that are supposed to daunt them. And that does suggest to me that what we've got going on is something really complex and far more, you know, surprise, surprise, nuanced um, human activity than we have imagined onto the past. OK, last one here. Chelsea Bianca Bassnett asks, when will your new book be released and what is the title? So the book on, that I've been talking about today, um, thanks for this question, um, is called The Voices of Neem. Um, and it is out already, it came out last year. Um, and, um, but I'm working on another book now, uh, also on women, far more famous ones. Let's just say that Catherine of Aragon is part of it. But The Voices of Neem, Women, Sex and Marriage and Reformation in Langdok is out now. Thank you so much everybody for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your questions too.